this one. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, for the first time in Oslo. I'm super excited. And um, as we have uh, this occasion to, to gather and, uh, and think and speak together, I wanted to, to try a little exercise um, together. Um, you may be familiar with those movements that are uh, turning into folkloric movements, whether it's from the traditional left, so the anti-capitalist left that ends up you know, reciting the doctrine of holy Marx, uh, like if it was some kind of evangel, to the uh, far right that go on reciting their pseudoscience about nation and race and whatever shit. Um, I think every movement is somehow at risk of becoming a parody of itself. Um, and I want this not to happen with the free software movements, because I think that they are absolutely critical for a future we want to see in this world. I also thought of this um, because I think we dearly, deeply need to take time to think about strategy. Think about strategy, which means thinking about a, a shared vision, a common vision for the future. You may be familiar with this as well, that very often you're so busy doing these things that you have to be doing right now because nobody else is doing them, that you end up forgetting thinking about tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and end up in some kind of routine, and end up sometimes burning out or just getting depressed and thinking that there is no meaning to that. So I, I think we have this kind of a collective duty to, to think the future, uh, and, and that somehow thinking the future amounts to inventing it. And inventing the future means uh, making it happen, making it possible. So again, it, it may sound presumptuous, but I will attempt at, a, at, a, an, at an exercise in this. Uh, also, and I think that was my uh, initial motivation for that, I want to tell you this story, I want to, to involve you in this story, I want to hear you about this story, because I found out some years ago that while growing as a um, privileged uh, white nerd, uh, having access to, to those uh, fancy uh, microcomputers during my, my whole youth, having developed myself as someone who profoundly loved these machines made of uh, silicon and, and, and plastic, I ended up, right now, some years ago, figuring out that I was today actually hating those machines, hating those computers, those laptops, those devices that some still call telephones. Th those things are now, I hate them from all my guts. I would crush them. Uh, and I wondered, what happened? What happened in those 15, 20 years? From the age of the, the, the law of computing to the dark era of hate computing. And this is the story I want to tell you today. This is what, what I want to suggest as a way to, to formulate, as a way to, to shape a vision to the future. And it's also a bit of an exercise somehow in storytelling. Because if for one thing, in all my years of uh, activism and campaigning, I found out that uh, when us nerds are very often uh, holding some very precious knowledge, uh, the more knowledgeable we are about it, the more complicated it becomes to, to speak and interact with people who don't hold this knowledge. So, my point here is that we reached the age of hatred computing. Uh, if you look at those devices, it's been, uh, I think, since the Intel Core uh, i5, so it's probably more than 10 years now, that every single computer from, uh, well, i386, as we call them still, Every single computer manufactured by Intel contains actually two computers. You have your processor, your management, your memory engine and, and, and the such. And on the very same chip, this so-called system on a chip, you have this management 
engine. Who here has heard of the management engine before? That's more than half the room. It's one of the, the very rare places in the world where you will see as many people knowledgeable about the management engine. For those who don't know here, the management engine is a computer within a computer, equipped with an OS, a proprietary OS, that gets activated before everything, before anything actually gets done on your computer. And this computer has been designed in proprietary terms, so the user cannot access it, cannot understand it, and cannot modify it. It took about 10 years before we found one method to m mostly disable the management engine without the computer crashing after 30 minutes. If you try to disable it, it inevitably crashed after 30 minutes before a, a, few, a few months ago. So here we are with those manufacturers who do not let us an option but to buy computers that contain another computer that is specifically designed to be inaccessible from us. Of course, it's management engine. You need management, right? In corporate environment, you need to remotely access other people's computer, right? So you don't mind that your computer has the capacity to let some people access it remotely? You don't mind? Yes, you do. Yeah, yes, I do, too. And the, the, the sad matter of fact is that it happened. We didn't have a word. Most people don't know about it. But this is the state of each and every modern computer today. Those mobile pieces of crap that some still call telephones, the same. They contain two computers and two operating systems. Who here has heard about the baseband? Again, that's more than half the room here. Uh, in some technical specifications of the manufacturers themselves, the computer you use, the processor that displays the fancy apps we swipe, is called the slave processor. In the same documentation, the basement processor is called the master processor. The basement is the computer that communicates with the network. It's much more than just an elaborate modem because it also received commands from the network. Therefore, this computer has the ability to be remotely activated. And again, by sitting on the very same chip as the main computer, it has direct DMA access, direct access to the memory. Therefore, it means game over in terms of security. The master processor can take control of the slave processor. And as the master processor is activated through the network, and as you're only controlling the slave computer, it means game over. There is no way we'll be able to achieve decent level of computer security on these pieces of crap. And no signal, no Tor, no GPG will come and fix that. Uh, what happened is partially revealed by the documents published uh, since the, the great act of courage of Edward Snowden, is that those companies, hey, yes, you are the one fighting. That's your fight too. You're right. That's very right. Um, since uh, Mr. Snowden risked his life to enable us to take a look at this, we figured that these companies were a part of a gigantic web of perverting technology, of sabotaging technology for the last 15 or 20 years and turn it into something else. Among the, the partners, the partners of the NSA who actually don't have a choice to be partner or not because they're incorporated in the US of A, you have, of course, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, Apple, but you also see Intel, Qualcomm, the designers of those basement chips, Motorola, Cisco, all these companies that all together run, what, 99 point something percent of whatever computing we use every day, all these companies are called in this web of mass spying. So what happened is that over the last 15 years, we somehow let this happen. It happened under our watch. 
we were so excited, fancy pansy about how the internet was going to change the world, you know, this one click democracy and happiness that will be sent to the world. We took so much that for granted that we didn't see it coming. And we let it happen. And someday, people like this little one over there will ask us, what the fuck were you doing? What have you, wh where were you? Where were you when they were turning computing into the perfect tool for oppression? Because this is what this hatred computing is about. It is about mistrusting the end user, the person who buys this piece of crap, as beautifully illustrated by Vladan earlier. These pieces of crap containing half the materials in the world dug from the earth by those slaves. These pieces of crap, when you buy them, now behave like you were their enemy. They mistrust you, and they assume that you should not understand them, that you should not control them fully. These machines are built on hate. These machines are built on ideas such as the one that everyone in the world is a potential suspect. That everyone in the world is a potential enemy of the US of fucking A. What it means is the premises of what some call algorithmic governance or cybernetic governance. When the institutions and the people running them are not anymore in charge of understanding other people for who they are and organizing a life together where, where compromise be found and interest be shared over, no. Their, their, their job profoundly shifted into putting people into numbers and getting those numbers administered. And if it can be done by some magical black box sold by Google or, or one of their partners in the military industrial complex like Raytheon or Palantir, then no big deal. You're administering numbers. So what's the difference if you let a machine doing it in the stead of you? So at the same time as we witnessed this shift from a computing that anyone can understand, a computing that anyone can, can uh, relate to, a computing that you can actually love. Like, remember those 8-bit machines? Four screws, a manual, and here you go. You could understand everything that was there. It was made for you to understand. At the same time, we shifted from this love computing to this hatred computing, entirely designed to control us and to enable the, the most tragic oppression we can think of, is precisely the same period of time when we've seen politics turn from, well, politics, to this cybernetic governance, where those technocrats now turn us into numbers and can replace anyone by any, anyone else. So, my point here is that if you think that whatever you do with computers today is not political, well, think again, because we let this happen. It happened under our watch. So if you think you have no responsibility over it and over the future and what's going to be done with it, then think again. And don't wait until one more of this uh, personal data leak uh, wipes uh, the, the entire bank accounts or uh, lives of people before realizing that. So, this is political. We let this happen. Those machines hate us. Sometimes we even hate those machines. Where do we go from there? Because there is somewhere to go. And fortunately, Richard Stallman uh, was so smart that 30 years ago, he showed us the, the way somehow. The, the very premises of the GNU project are based on the fact that we humans must control the machine and not let ourselves controlled by it. But then, wh where do we do from here? Wh where do we go? How do we go back to a state of computing where we can uh, trust the machine? Where we can communicate with each other in full trust? 
Is there a path, is there a way to go back to this love computing? Well, part of the exercise I wanted to, to put on the table here is to try precisely to understand what are the fundamental differences from a, a view of the world of this NSA, Google, Intel, uh, Raytheon, Palantir, who turn the computers into machines of oppression, to the pioneer spirit of microcomputing, to the revolutionary spirit of Richard and free software in general, to these ideals of shared kindness and humanism that we still believed in in the late 90s when we were speaking about the internet. Where is the profound difference? And how can we foster this difference? How can we use it as a strength for ourselves and for our movements? Well, it's not by accident that I use these terms of love and hate, and sorry if the manichaeism of it sounds a little bit childish, but I think that strategically, when we look at our opponents, when we look at this mass of paranoid people and entities, and look at their power, look at their energy, we sometimes feel crushed. They have almost infinite resources. The budget of the NSA is, is almost infinite. Google. Hmm. So we won't be able to compete with these people on their field, using their view, on, their view on, of the world, using the same type of resources as they do. We won't outdata Google. We won't out money the NSA. We won't out men and women uh, this military or industrial complex. Yet, love, kindness that, that we share, I think, is one of these infinite energies. It is absolutely abundant on the face of the earth. It is absolutely abundant in within ourselves. But how does that relate to computing, one may ask? Hmm. And what is love, anyways, in the first place? So, there are many definitions, and I'm not trying, well, if I were to try to define love, I would obviously fail, because I think one of its characteristics is that it cannot be really defined. Uh, one of its characteristics is that it, it is surprising, I think. You think you like this or that type of people, and the next day, boom, you fall in love with somebody who is outside of this stereotype. You think that you will never fall in love again, and boom, it happens. But also, I think one of the characteristics of love is that when you truly love someone, you will accept their flaws. You will accept their, their defects. You will accept things that otherwise you wouldn't accept. I hate people when they're always late. Yet, sometimes you're in love with someone and that someone is always late. And it seems not much of a deal after some time. So, I think accepting the flaws of someone uh, is always a, a fantastic uh, exercise because it confronts you to your very own flaws. Why wouldn't you tolerate something at all? What does it tell about you? How should you work on yourself, maybe to make yourself better, more tolerant? And the more you tolerate, maybe the more you, you develop this capacity to tolerate. Maybe the more you, 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 you love, the more you develop this capacity to love. So accepting the flaws is somehow, I think, accepting, acknowledging the differences. That someone is always late, you're always punctual. Well, maybe love shows you that it's okay, that you are not absolutely right about being punctual all the time and the other is not absolutely wrong about being late all the time. Maybe it's just a different way of being right. Maybe there's no right or wrong. Maybe it's just different views on the world. And I think precisely this energy, this way of looking at each other and accepting each other in our glorious diversity is what we somehow attempt to do but fail at in various free software communities I've been around. 
the easiest thing to do is to mimic the, the structures and the behaviors that are dominant. We see big companies, we don't have the money, but we will incorporate ourselves, turn ourselves into companies. We see big NGOs, non-profit, we think that the only way of having an impact in the world is to incorporate, to create one of these associations. So we end up creating structures of power very similar to the ones we see in the world of those paranoid haters. We, we create our very own hierarchies. We create our very own clans. We, we create lines of conflict in between whoever is using VI or Emacs or GNOME or KDE or FreeBSD or NetBSD or Ubuntu or Debian or Fedora. We, I think we, we are actually falling in our very own trap. Uh, this diversity is precisely what makes the strength of free Libre software. It's precisely what we need to celebrate. You're using Emacs, I'm using VI. Please show me your cool Emacs tricks. Maybe I will be using Emacs tomorrow. Maybe someday you'll be using VI too. But the fact that Emacs exists along with VI is something I should be celebrating every day. So thinking or communities, thinking or world, and thinking the, the future we want to see in those terms, I think is, is a heart opening. Instead of seeing yourself with your profile of a, a KDE slash Emacs slash Ubuntu and feeling not alone in this world, but feeling part of a very small something, you can see yourself as part of this beautiful ocean of diversity and see everyone as a, as a potential ally, as a potential friend you can learn from. But such a vision of the world also, I think, give us to think about trust itself. Who do we trust and how do we trust? What's the very nature of trust? If someone here studied that from, from a scientific perspective, I'd be absolutely glad to hear more about it. Because to me, it's a bit of a mystery. Sometimes you just randomly meet someone and I, oh, I don't, I'm not gonna trust this person. And sometimes the opposite, you know? This person is cool, I think we can go anywhere together. It's nothing in the eyes, it's nothing in the face, it's nothing in what they do or say, because they can even be silent. Something very hard to explain, something very subtle. And I think we, we have to, to look at this, somehow study this, in order to understand and define the way we want the future of computing to be. So I have uh, lots of examples that I'm, I'm willing to discuss with you. But what I think are um, key directions, essential directions where we might be going for a future. I think basically we have to rewrite computing from scratch. I think we have to rethink everything we took for granted. Now that we know that A, those computers are enemies, they hate us, they think we are potential suspects. They are built to consider us as potential suspects. And B, now that we know that the network is actually hostile, and that anything that goes on the network and that is not end-to-end -end encrypted will be used. And anything that circulates end-to-end -end encrypted will probably generate metadata that will be used also. I think we have to rebuild everything from scratch. And I see everywhere tiny bits, tiny Ponds of hope. Have you heard, for instance, and I will be name dropping here for, for one minute or two, have you heard of the low risk platform? Low risk is a system on a chip based on the risk architecture whose primary objective is that it will be 100% controllable with free software. No more proprietary bro uh, broadcom crap at the heart of our uh, computers. No more fucking management engine and the, the such. Maybe in a few years, or, or, or love computers will be equipped with these very simple chips. The Olimex DIY laptop, this 250 euro laptop designed in Bulgaria, 
that you can assemble from scratch, component by component. And someday you will just change its core or its graphic card. It's ecological, it's educational, it's cheap. And maybe someday you will retrofit a low-risk core is in one of those. Mirage OS by our amazing friend Hannes in Berlin, who programmed this unikernel of an operating system in OCaml with mathematical proof that there is no heap overflow, no stack overflow. Attack surface reduce the size of a, of a molecule. A, a DNS server that starts in 10 milliseconds and that stands, I think, on 600K of an operating system. All these beautiful projects exist, and I could, I could name more, but maybe we'll do this in a more uh, interactive session or later on with some uh, expensive alcohol at the, at the, at the party. Um, my point is we should not be aware to forget everything we took for granted, to put everything to the trash and think everything anew. I think it is extremely necessary today. I think we must not be afraid. We must not be shy. I think we must look at ourselves in the mirror, in the eyes, and find that courage. I think we'll find also this courage in, in this beautiful diversity that we have around us, that we must learn to, to celebrate to foster, rather than perpetuating the habits of oppression, where diversity is seen as, a, as something to, to oppose and to combat. I think it requires some efforts, but is not unattainable. I think this is what we have to tell to our friends and people around us. This is what we stand for. This is what free software means. Free software is computing made for helping our neighbors, for loving our neighbors, and eventually, in the end, maybe for loving ourselves. Free software is maybe the only way we can achieve trust in computing someday. And it requires no compromise, no bloody pieces of proprietary code embedded within our hardware. Of course not. We've seen these exploits of Broadcom and, and Bluetooth and all the shit. I think we are capable of that. Uh, I think this is in practice what we are already doing with free software and its spirit. But as I told you, I wanted to put these words here to see what you think of, of them and see how we can use this maybe together uh, to, again, to, to invent this future to imagine this future together, yes, you, your future, to, to imagine this future together is actually making it happen. So let's go, let's go. Let's, let's build this future of computing based on love and, and, and that's it, thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, uh, that was quite enticing. Um, I'm involved with um, social and behavioral informatics, and um, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Right, I believe that um, uh, um, we have a couple of questions, and uh, pretty much 20 minutes, I would say. Yeah, so um, one, two, three. Yeah, I'm glad that Nadia, you've lifted up your hand. I was looking forward to your comment. Um, yeah, so we'll start with... Um, It was a fantastic speech, and I will, uh, of course, of not of course, put a damper on it. When I was philosopher at Tactical Tech, one of the way of uh, shocking people was to say, I said, use free software and go to jail. <laughs> it almost happened in Italy. There is a danger, I, I think people should realize, that if you step out of the system, the very fact that you are not part of the system is already makes you suspic suspicious. Andre Holm, I don't know if the name is known, was helicoptered from Berlin to Karlsruhe, which is quite expensive, because he didn't have a mobile phone. A mobile phone, as you know, is a tracking device 
with which accessorily you can place phone calls. You explained also very well what was inside the mobile phone. That's, that's why concern, and that's how you address it. And for, this is for the militants, say, but even for the general public, stepping out of the system makes that they have to live in a parallel universe. So how do we realize that and how do we address that? That's, that's an open question. Well, ah, it's, it's very right. Uh, the, the good thing, well, it's actually very bad. The good thing is actually we already all suspect. I, I used to, to explain a few things about mass surveillance in, in, uh, in, in setups like this one. And I could feel, you know, when you speak to students or the more you feel to people who are established and in the system, that they think, you know, there's nothing to hide. They think this, you know, I'm not, I'm not a target. I'm not, it, it may not even be, I'm, I'm, I have nothing to hide. It may just be, you know, I'm not a person of interest. There's like, there's literally nothing in my life. And I was telling them that, that, you know, the NSA surveys three levels of relationship. So somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows you. And I told them, you know what? I know Julian Assange. And your mobiles are on in the same location as mine for one hour. So you know someone that knows Julian Assange, so you're in. <laughs> if you wonder what half of humanity you were in, the one being surveilled or the other one, well, pff, now you're in. So what's the problem, you know? So that's putting it in, in a bit of a joke. But my point here, you know, first they came for the people without a mobile phone and I didn't care because I had one. Then they came for the people using Tor and I didn't care because I wasn't. And then they came for every single owner of a device, you know. Um, the, the, the question of how to be out and when to be out, I think is absolutely critical. And I think that's one of the, the greatest teachings we got from uh, whatever came up of uh, Snowden's action is that many of us uh, who didn't think of it before thought, oh shit, fuck, in some context, I will leave my phone at home or I will be offline. So somehow, paradoxically, Snowden showed us the importance of offline. And I think that this is something to, to cultivate, something to foster. When I, I do the equivalent of security training to people, most of the time I spend not speaking about computers at all not even needing to have a computer in the room, explaining a very generic concept of security, which more or less rely on compartmentalizing information after establishing a threat model and identifying where is the risk, what is at risk. So very often, actually more often than not, if you want to achieve security for communications or for some data, just don't use a fucking computer. So it, it actually makes sense. They went so far in their paranoid sabotaging of our infrastructure that more often than not, there is no other option than to not use computers and not use phones. So my bet is the more person will understand that, the less abnormal it would be to be sometimes offline and somehow uh, be the haystack you want to see in this world to, to hide needles in, you know? Yeah, thank you. Second question, up here. We had like three hands up, right? Nadia? <laughs> so, um, an observation and a question. Observation being that I, I see in, in a lot of these contexts where um, people are pushing for, you know, freedom or care or whatever in their professional lives and in their work, especially if it involves machines, it's like, it's, it's, it's like it lives on its own, right? But they live in a setting, they live in a house, their relationships are shaped a certain way with other people and, and the environment around them. 
and it can make them more or less uh, safe, right? Psychosocially, etc. Okay. So my question to you is, these groups that you see um, building the free software, do you see them changing their lifestyles as well? <laughs> and if so, how? That's an amazing question, and I thank you so much, because it gives me an occasion to actually pitch Hacking with Care. Uh, Hacking with Care is a, is a um, loose collective of people I co-founded with a few dear friends uh, that aims at bringing care, understood very in a very generic way, as shared goodness, uh, goodness that can be shared from individual to individual or community-wise, shared this care uh, with hackers, activists, and other people exposed on the, the front lines of these fights. At the same time that we plan on bringing hacker tools and hacker ethics to the caregivers uh, in order to actually bring them closer to the front line without endangering the people who care. Uh, so we, we've been doing that because of precisely what you, what you described, that there is very often a profound discrepancy in between the, the, the global objectives of anyone caring for a better world, better future, and freedom, and democracy, that in turn will turn into a pathetic dictator in their very tiny space and oppress the people around them without even noticing sometimes. Because sometimes just working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, can be oppressive to people around you if they don't manage to, to follow you. And because of this disconnection, you know, of the pure mind, of the brilliant hacker, and the body that is somehow left rotting on a chair with sugar, water, shit, and pizza, uh, we, we see around us pathologies. We see around us an incredible amount of people going depressed, feeling miserably alone, uh, burning out. Uh, there are people in our communities even committing suicide. Um, so, yes, I think that's precisely it, is that we need somehow to reconfigure ourselves to be able to reconfigure our communities. Be the change you want to see in this world. Uh, personally, I, it took me years and a burnout to realize that whatever I would do, it should work for me, then maybe, by example, it will work for the people around me, and maybe would propagate to the world. I cannot just have a vision for the world and not care about myself, not care about the people around me. It's not going to work. So that's the point of Hacking with Care, and there is actually another talk about it <laughs> tomorrow. Join us. Um, that's the point that we, we must embed those principles of care and love and joy in within the very fabric of our movements and our communities. And when this project, this organization, this hackerspace will fail because people will hate each other and shout and all for any other reason, that we will think of the next one embedding these principles. Uh, I think that's one of the, the many manifestations of how this love, this goodness, can help for a better future. So again, thank you so much for this question. A follow-up, maybe? That was a brilliant answer, um, Jeremy. Okay, there's, there's a follow-up, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Those are really nice principles, but I'd urge to push even further. So what I've seen is that it comes down to asking yourself what relationship you have with money, right? Because this is somehow where the evil begins. Like, what relationship do you have with money? What is the economic configuration of your life? How, does, how do resources flow from where? I think if you rethink that, and there's so many, I mean, just the sheer cognitive computing power that's in this room, like if that were directed towards money and really thinking deeply about how we want to be related to money, I don't have the answers, but I, I would urge that this is the push. Like, if we want to be caring, push there. Thanks. 
Do we have time for another question? Yeah. Yay. Um, there was one here in the front row, I think. Where were you? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Hi there. Uh, a couple of thoughts, and uh, I'm interested in getting some feedback on. Uh, one was your, uh, you start out the most uh, specific technical implementation stuff. You were focused on uh, endpoint devices, uh, a laptop example, processor, uh, a mobile phone, baseband. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in the keynote uh, today, of course, there's plenty of uh, potentially uh, sinister stuff happening with uh, not just on endpoints, but of course in, in all of the most popular services that we use knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, so, so you're really talking about, uh, you know, if you want to protect yourself and you're, you're going to the point of, uh, of course, using uh, no devices or using a uh, fully open and verifiable firmware, uh, then you're also going to have to not use any of the services that uh, everybody is, is using, right? So, uh, and, and yet we see that there's tremendous power to, uh, to uh, get uh, raise awareness and, and get momentum behind various positive social movements through things like social media. So, do you really think that uh, an anti such an anti sectarian approach is the right approach? And uh, and then kind of a, a a lead in if you look at some of the the work like uh, reinventing the the future is a very interesting. Uh, read that basically goes through how the left has has failed uh, and the right has won over the last uh, roughly century or so, and some of the mistakes that we continue to make on the left are to to throw away uh, methods and structures that are used on the right simply because they're used on the right. Uh, well, maybe you know, maybe they use them because they work, not because they have uh, necessarily inherent. Uh, qualities that, that are uh, or have to be oppressive in any way? Well, uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for this suggestion. You know, you know how you, you see that you have an excellent audience? is when people suggest or ask questions about exactly all you forgot to mention, because that's part of the case here, and I'm super duper thankful. Uh, but first of all, I think if there were to be such a thing as left and right, which I'm not exactly sure exists still. I think I would see more of a difference in between the, the secular and the adaptatives. The secular being the people reciting Marx as a mantra, you know, <laughs> and, and the ones who just look at the world and, and, and plan and strategize and act upon it. People you may call the right, or people one would call the fascists, or the global techno, uh, militaro, industrial, oppressive uh, complex. Uh, these people have the Rand Corporation, and other think tanks more or less funded by the CIA, who produce 20 years in advance strategic documents that they just grab and implement. These people have InQtel, the hedge fund of the CIA, that puts money in Google and Facebook and so many other companies that they consider be of strategic interest for the, 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 the US of fucking A. So these people work hard on their future. They throw billions at it, and they get a return of investment, you know, because that's, that's, that's how they, they, they think. When most of us, you know, even I've been, <laughs> I'm guilty, I've been for years standing for fundamental rights, you know? But what the fuck is a fundamental right? Sure, there is a charter somewhere signed by a bunch of, uh, old people that defines them, but it's really how we see them today in relationship with what is the, the, the reality of the, at a given time that we should consider, not what is enshrined in a, in a dusty text. Um, about the, your, your first point, and this is where I'm the most thankful, is yes, yes, and yes. Free software alone won't save us from anything. We need at least free software and hardware we can trust, with end-to-end -end encryption and decentralized services. This is the holy trinity in four parts uh, that I somehow forgot to, to, to mention earlier. Uh, I say free software and hardware we can trust as two elements of one same part because now the, the frontier between hardware and software is somehow lost. 
software, initializes some hardware that loads some software that we call firmware, and, and it's, a, it's a clusterfuck. So yeah, free software and hardware we can trust alone won't lead us anywhere if you use it to connect to, to the Facebook. And, uh, and when you look at it, a decentralization of services and, and of communications and data makes sense. It makes sense socially because it gives you freedom of choice. Uh, it makes sense um, politically because it enables you to decide who holds power and to avoid that too much power would be concentrated uh, somewhere. It makes sense technologically because it's a better, redundant, resilient use of the resources. The only, only place where it may not entirely make sense yet is economically. Because it's usually easier, therefore cheaper, to make it centralized and it will bring shitloads of money for whoever does it successfully. So we have also to push the, the ethical principles behind decentralization. Sure, it's much harder, but look at us, how brilliant, diverse and clever we are. There is no mathematical problem that we can't solve. And, and yes, thanks again, uh, decentralization is one of these major objectives without which computing may still be hating us for long. Brilliant. Uh, um, <laughs> Thanks. And join us tomorrow for a Hacking with Care session. <laughs> yeah, Hacking with Care. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Jeremy. And um, I would say um, uh, that was quite um, enticing because um, um, according, to, according to me, in my perspective, um, as I told you, I'm uh, pretty much involved in social and behavioral informatics. Um, uh, you mentioned three points that um, are quite encouraging, and that was um, acknowledging uh, the flaws, um, especially, well, if you're pretty much um, um, aware or maybe involved in the healthcare, healthcare systems, then maybe you might uh, be having um, um, some ideas of how maybe um, uh, um, um, development programs um, that have really not worked, especially with programs that are being implemented in the global south. And uh, I think the mo one of the most important things is actually um, to accept um, our flaws, our flaws of systems, and maybe come back and um, try to fix it and maybe uh, put it in a flexibility uh, point of um, uh, point of view, which uh, you mentioned earlier, that was great. And the next one was trust, um, that was brilliant. And uh, and the third one was rethinking. I think that was brilliant because um, rethinking basically we're going back to history and looking at um, um, what kind of um, 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 of, or which kind of model be used in uh, information systems and whether we can restructure it. So I think uh, that was quite um, uh, um, encouraging. Thank you very much.